welcome to everyone here and welcome to everyone who's joining us online. Um, honestly, when I do anything like this, whether it's a small CE5 or five people or a virtual call, which I've seen many familiar faces here from, from the virtual meetups that we do, one of the first things that I do is I look out over everything and I see every single person, not as the physical being that you are here, but the divine light being that you really are. And when you do that, it is such a beautiful thing because that being, that is the love. So, um, so yeah, and welcome everyone. Glad to have you here. Yes. Okay. It is a, I just want to add to that, it is such an honor to be here to be able to speak to you guys because CE5, one thing that Pat and I have learned is that CE5 groups and people that are into doing this are family. We really, really are. And over the years, going to different expeditions and CE5 meetings and groups and meeting so many wonderful people, uh, it's just been truly amazing. And one of the main things we've learned is that CE5 has so many wonderful implications for our civilization going forward, but even more so, it has amazing implications for us as individuals our own personal growth. And we can tell you that from actual personal experience. This is not an academic understanding that we're sharing. We have seen thousands of people come through the Texas uh, training and probably thousands uh, go through Dr. Greer's events. So many people have had so many wonderful experiences. And what we're gonna do today is really try to give you a practical kind of step-by-step -step guide for setting up your team and doing this so that you can feel comfortable setting up a team. And interspersed throughout this, we're going to try to share stories as we have time and uh, some amazing stories there that we'll share as well. So listen, it is an honor to be here to speak to you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Yes, my name is Justice Campbell, and of course, you know Pat Pearsall, Pat, one of my dearest friends in the world. Pat and I have been on expeditions. Was it the Austin expedition? And I, they all blend together, and I forget the year. Was it 2016, 2017, somewhere around there? So about five years, and we've been to every expedition with Dr. Greer except for one. We both missed uh, the same one, and uh, they had some amazing sightings there, of course. <laughs> The one that got away from us, yes. Let's hope that that is not an indication of anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you, we have also had over the years uh, an absolutely amazing, oh my God, moments where we've seen things and experienced things and seen other people experiencing this phenomenon and this amazing growth in consciousness that it causes for in each and every one of us. And to me, that's what's so important right? Because oh, yeah. it changes your life. It changes the possibilities that you see for your life. And everything is different from there on. Your business relationships, your personal relationships, your life in general, everything changes and it's for the better. And so even if, if you're online and maybe you're saying, I'm not sure if I want to do ET contact, the process of raising our consciousness to do this has such a profound effect on your life Everybody on the planet should be doing this, period. This is the most important thing going on on the planet right now. That's very true. When I first got involved with this, one of the things that I thought, and, and Faith, you and I had this conversation as well, that, you know, CE5 brings people in who have never meditated, ever. I mean, they've never meditated, right? And they would never probably meditate, except for now they're involved with CE5, they're interested, they look into it, they develop a meditative practice. And the minute that you do that, and I mean the minute, the first meditation that you ever do, you immediately at that moment begin to change everything in your life. It, it, I think it changes people on a cellular level, actually. And from that point forward, not only do you change, but everything around you changes. Because remember, this is energy we're talking about. It's not just 
the energy within you. It's the energy that radiates from you. It touches everything, your life, your household, your family, the people you're around. It really radiates everywhere. So to me, this is one of the most important. You know, everybody who knows me from CE5 knows that my total passion and love is the study of consciousness. Yes, yes, the technology is very important, but that is really always, has never been really my uh, true interest. You know, I just think there's already too, too much technology and I think we need more consciousness. We need more consciousness, less technology. So, um, yeah, so I just wanted to add that. Yes, Mark. Oh, thank you for reminding me that. Thank you. Uh, yes, if everyone could turn your cell phones off or silence them or put them on airplane mode. I mean, I know that some people need to have their phones with them. They're either, you know, family issues or medical issues. But, but if you could, please uh, put them on vibrate or something. If you have to have them on, that would be great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Okay, I'm curious, just uh, by a show of hands, how many of you have actually done a CTS or know what that is? Good, we're going to do one today because that is something that is fundamental to the contact protocols. Uh, so we'll go through that at the end. We want to make sure, Pat, we have time for that. I think that's very important that we do that. Um, let me start by saying that one of the things that Pat and I really believe, and all the CE5 team members will tell you, is that when you're starting a team, one of the most important things uh, for yourself personally and also for your team is to get the basics right. I can't tell you how many people and how many teams I've seen start up as a team and they end up a UFO social club. Okay, and that's very common. It's hard not to do because all that stuff Dr. Grid talks about, that disinformation, all the stuff online, it's very sexy. People love to listen and talk about that stuff and then, oh, this ET, that ET group. And you really, really have to understand that there are a couple of basic pillars that Dr. Greer talks about that are fundamental to doing this. And Pat will tell you that over the years we've seen the people that have the fundamentals right get this and they have amazing growth and amazing experiences. Then we have other people that come in that miss the couple of fundamentals which we're about to talk about and they move on and, and they don't understand, they don't get it. What are you doing, All right? So it's very important to get the fundamentals. Now, when you talk about the fundamentals of CE5, uh, Steve talks about a couple of things and he kind of upended me last night and shared a lot of this, but I'm gonna say that first of all, he says, no fear. You cannot have fear and do this process. Fear stops the meditative process. You will not be able to make contact in consciousness. And should you make contact in consciousness, having that fear will immediately stop it. Okay? So if you have had, and here's the thing, you may think, oh, I don't have any fear. This is exciting. I can't wait to do this. Let me promise you, each and every one of you have some amount of fear. Everybody does, because you could not grow up on this planet the last 50 years with all the disinformation that's been out there, all the evil ET scary stuff, and all the, well, they're all good except that one group, all of that nonsense. If you've been subjected to that, and you have, you have a little bit of fear. Now, here's the thing about fear, folks. Fear, and this comes from a personal experience of mine, I'll share in a moment, but fear if allowed to just fester in your consciousness, whether you know it or not, turns into anger. Over a amount of time, you get angry. Have you ever had somebody come up and say something, sometimes it's a family member, and you just blow up at them for a, supposedly no reason at all, and you wonder what just happened? You've had some kind of a fear that's been bothering you, right? This is something we have to root out. You cannot have fear. And there are a couple of ways to, and not only, um, through uh, just all the media that you've seen, but if you have any kind of hate or prejudice towards any ET group because of something you've heard online or, or somebody told you, then you cannot do this. You have to root that out. Now, you can get rid of that fear through powerful meditation techniques, which Pat will talk about here in a little bit. You can get rid of it through an academic study of the process which is kind of what happened to me. And uh, let me tell you just that quickly, what happened to me. Um, I grew up in Texas and uh, 
big backyard. We set out as kids in the backyard and would watch the stars with our parents. Back then, they were all smokers. Back then, smoking was healthy for you, and they were heavy smokers. So we'd go out in the backyard, and as kids, they would smoke, and we would just all watch the stars. And I remember looking at the satellites going over. Can you mute it just a little bit? We'll talk about that in a minute. That's a magnetometer. That's a magnetometer going off there. We've squelched it for the energy level here. If it goes off, it's an additional something happening. There's some other energy that's coming in. So anyway, we would sit out in the backyard and look at the stars and watch. And um, um, I loved ETs and the idea of this growing up. But then when I went to college, there was a movie that came out uh, called Fire in the Sky, the Travis Walton story. If you haven't seen it, I do not recommend it. It was... <laughs> It was a flop at the box office because it was so fearful and so negative. But what happened to me was I watched that film. I thought, oh, that was fun. I was in college, no big deal. And I went on with life. But that caused a little bit of fear in the back of my mind. Even if I didn't admit it, there was a little bit of fear. Could that be? Could those ETs have really done those horrible things in that movie? And that turned into anger. And then that anger turned into hate. And folks, I spent 10 years of my life in this heavy energy of anger and hate. And I would have supported a war against ETs instantly, without any question. And that energy, Pat's described it as an energy of like being in quicksand. And I kind of think of it as the same thing, or like being in a thick vat of molasses. I don't know why I think of it that way. Have you ever been in a thick vat of molasses? <laughs> no one ever has. But anyway, to me, it just seems like it's such a thick energy. And to make any kind of spiritual progress or growth in that energy, whether it's towards ET contact or just your life in general, is very, very difficult. So listen, drop that energy like you would drop a hot potato. Get rid of it. Do not allow all the negative stuff that's out there to scare you about anything. Because when you have the experience in meditation, not just an academic understanding, but an actual experience in meditation where you realize there is no death. It's simply a transition in consciousness that we're moving into, and it's a higher state that we're moving to. It's a wonderful thing to be happy and glad for. Not that you want to leave this planet. We're here for a reason. We have work to do. While we're here, we do that. But don't be afraid of death. There's nothing to be afraid of, and that will help get rid of the fear. That's one of the things, right, Pat? So that's one pillar, not being afraid not having prejudice. The other pillar is of, it really consists of the simple idea that the consciousness that we have, unlike what Western medicine would tell you, is caused from our physical brain and body and is isolated to us. But they've done actual studies and found that this consciousness has an effect at the quantum level. And so this universal consciousness is a field that we're simply joining into. And because of that, you can make contact with any life in the universe by simply going within to this field of consciousness. And that's a fundamental part of the contact protocols, which we'll talk about some more. So getting the basics right, no fear, no prejudice. Now, there's something quickly I'll share about prejudice. And Dr. Greer said it many, many times, and uh, we share it in Texas, and I've, I've read other authors. In fact, as a side note, you know, there's an old C-SETI reading list. Have you guys seen that? Maybe it's not on the website anymore. If it's not, we need to get it up there. But about 30 books. Listen, I spent two years of my life reading that reading list, and it was the most amazing growth spurt of my entire life just learning about all these different aspects of consciousness and the different fields of study that support this. So it's really something that is amazing. It's really something that's wonderful to do. Yeah. So. Did you want to share anything about the treatment? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to Thank you. Sometimes I, I lose my track, and I have to look at Pat, and she says, oh, yeah, do this. 
So I appreciate that. And you'll do that too. You'll get with your C5 groups and you'll start doing a talk or meditation and suddenly you go blank and wonder. You'll so also I'll, do that when you get my age. <laughs> <laughs> Very common. So prejudice, if you think about prejudice, uh, it, what, what I, the way I see it, most commonly, as people come out to Texas, we come to a, a very remote uh, nature filled area. And they'll see a tree, right? Tree, four letters, a couple of consonants, a couple of vowels, tree. Do you think that word or that concept, when you get, when you hear the word tree, encompasses all that that tree is? There's a difference between a concept in our head about something versus the reality in front of us. And that's so very important. If you take your name, my name is Justice, do I think those letters and that sound encompasses all that I am? Does it encompass all that you are? And it does not. Now the point here is that if you are prejudiced towards any, not even talking about ET contact yet, but if you're prejudiced against any person on this planet, what's really happening here is you are relating to a concept in your head about what that person is or what they're about. Let me ask you, if you see a person that is a strong leaning political one way or the other, or they're a certain age group, or they're a certain from a certain part of the planet. Do you have an idea about what they are and do you immediately think, oh, that's, that's what they are, they're this? Do you see a black person? Do you see a white person? We also have red and yellow people on this planet. Do you see a person's color and instantly have an idea of what they're about? Because if you do, you are relating to a concept in your head, not the reality in front of you. And here's the important thing about that, folks. When you take a live being and you reduce that live being to a concept in your head, you have already performed an act of violence. That is an act of spiritual violence. And if you look at the wars and the conflicts we've had on this planet over the last 200 years, you know, Steve has talked about it many times, so I won't go into it. You've all heard this. But if you look at... Uh, it, 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 it always involves one group of people putting down another group, saying they smell funny, or they look funny, or they're different. It's okay to hate them. That's where we get all the conflict and division, and we cannot go forward in this paradigm with that. That has to end. That's something that personal development, and it's something that, as we've learned as you go through this process, it eliminates that from you. And Pat mentioned earlier, you start to see the divine in people. If they have one good trait and 250 bad traits, see the one good trait in people and see the divine in them. We're all created by the same creator, right? And that creator loves them. That's so true. And that also applies to ETs, not just your neighbor, but you move this to ETs. We can't afford to say this is a certain phenotype ET, this is this, this is that. Those are concepts. When you're doing CE5, you got to get rid of those concepts and get the basics right. And if you can do that, everything else is going to fall into place. Absolutely. Okay. So that's all I want to share about that, just getting the basics right first. That's important. Once you've done that, building a team is what we're going to talk about now. Okay? Let me just advance this if I can. I didn't want to touch it. Okay. So get the basics right. We talked about no fear, no prejudice. Meditation and CTS, Pat's going to talk about, and we don't have to talk about it now unless you want to. But we'll Talk about it when we get to it. Okay. All right. I'm going to let you talk about the finding the site because how you found that site was really, it's probably beyond what many people here are going to be able to do. You were able to because you're a pilot and you know about that stuff. So I'll let you talk about that. Well, what I did was in a nutshell, I looked at Google Maps of our area and I said, where is an area that from the air I could do 
an easy vector to. So if you look around a map of your city, maybe there's a lake, maybe there's a certain land formation, something like that, and so we picked that. Now I also looked at aviation maps, and you get these at any airport, and they show military operation area, practice areas, and that's where the military goes out and practices, and they're out there all the time sometimes. So where we were in Dallas-Fort Worth, there was three quadrants around us, northwest, northeast, southeast, southwest, and um, three of those had big military, called MOAs, military operation areas, over them. And there's nothing wrong with doing CE-5 under a military operation area. I just try to deconflict where I can. <laughs> and so we moved to the area where there was no uh, military operation area, and in that area we found uh, some landmarks. They were very prominent that you could see from the air that we could easily show, here's where we're going, here's where we are, and we found that. And But finding land you can use is sometimes a little challenging. I had to drive out to that area. It was very remote. I found a house, and I went up to the house with my young daughter so that the mom that was home by herself wasn't terrified of this weird guy driving up. And I said, and I told her, I said, um, uh, we're an astronomy group. <laughs> uh-huh. And we'd like to come have groups meet out here and see the stars. Is there somebody I could talk to? She said, oh, my husband. He's the manager of this ranch, 170-something thousand acres. I said, is there a time I could see him? Yeah, here's his business card. So I called him and met with him. And I thought to myself, do I be honest with this guy? Do I tell him we're an astronomy group? In my heart, it said, be honest with this guy, you know. And I told him, I said, here's what we are. We do CE5. We make contact. We believe these civilizations are real. We believe that they're um, not here to hurt us and that we're trying to build a future of peace with them. And we'd like to come out because we come from the city where, you know, the, about the only celestial object we can see is the moon. And <laughs> we don't see many stars. And we certainly don't see the Milky Way. Right. And so... Uh, he said, you know what? He said, you can use this land. He said, on one condition. And I thought, oh, my heart sank. I said, oh, boy. He said, um, if you, you got to share with me what you learn about the ETs. <laughs> yeah. This is a rancher. I shook his hand, and he's got that rough, he, well, I work the land type, you know, and he just, pure in heart, and said, just tell me what you learned about the ETs. So I gave him Dr. Gurr's assessment, and uh, he was, in, for years now, we've been going to the same spot, and just absolutely loved it. It's really been a beautiful experience. And you can do the same thing. Uh, you can look for areas like, sometimes wineries will have a lot of land that you can go out on after hours. Um, and we'll talk about some of the other sites here, too, panel, that you, I don't want to take too much of the majority here but I'm, I'm fine just standing here i'm good i'm good <laughs> <laughs> okay so um public park areas there are state parks there are national parks and a word of caution for those um if you are near any of those and you want to use those make sure that you find out if you need permits if there's any permitting if there's any legal issues for you being out there at night some of them lock their gates at 10 or 11, you, you would hate to be out there with a group and then the gate's locked and yeah, you're spending the night. So that is one issue. Also, if you're in a public area or a public park, and we've had this, we had this happen at Joshua Tree one year, um, it is public and you can't tell people, you, you can't be here because we're here. It is a public area. So you need to be thoughtful about your site invasion, right? People wandering up. Uh, yes, and in Joshua Tree, we had, we were in the middle of a meditation and all of a sudden there was a couple campers, guys, and had been certainly partaking of whatever. Uh, they came stumbling into the group like, hey, what are you guys doing up here? So you do have to be aware of that as well. So those are a couple of ideas about the public versus, and if you're going to do it on private property, you can do it on your own private property, no problem. But if you're going to do it on someone else's private property, make sure that you have um, the permission to do that, or this could can easily be an issue, right? We can all imagine that. Um, you talked a little bit about light pollution considerations. You know, sometimes it's just not possible to get far enough away from the light pollution. I live in Houston. I go out in my backyard. I sit there. I can barely see, uh, the only stars I can see, I see Orion, I can see Sirius, but I can't see the Milky Way and I can't see a lot of other things. So um, sometimes it's, you can't really get away from it, but as much as you're able to, get to an area where there is less light pollution, less, okay? Um, 
Noise is also an issue. We've talked about this recently. You know, noise, there are, you know, if your site is near a road, uh, if it's a heavily traveled road, I mean, that's just going to be the way it is. You're going to have to just deal with that, right? Uh, so, so know that that noise can also be an issue. Let's see what else we have here. Okay. We have been on some CE5s where we have been out in the middle of nowhere. And um, I have to say, I have carried my chair, a table, my backpack, food, water, uh, a quarter of a mile or so into hilly, scrubby areas, no light, really, you know, my kids are like, mom, seriously? <laughs> but, you know, so you have to be mindful. Now, I'm able to do that, even at my age. But, um, you know, you want to be mindful if there's anyone in your team who has any kind of physical disability who may need help, who may need help carrying chairs out there. So, if you can find one where you can easily park and people can set up easily, that, that works a little bit better. But just be mindful of people who, who might come to your uh, CE5 events with any kind of disabilities. So accessibility is important. Um, unobstructed view of the night sky. Obviously, you wouldn't want to be in an area that is completely covered in trees. Can you still make contact that way? Absolutely, you can. I've made contact in my living room, okay, many times. So you can make contact anywhere, right? I was living in Colorado, Colorado Springs for a while, a few years back. And um, it's kind of a funny story. Uh, I'm almost embarrassed to tell it. <laughs> I was in the living room. It was like, I don't know, 10 degrees. I am not a cold weather person. Anybody who knows me knows that I, I that's why I love Texas. Um, I'm sitting there, it's freezing out, so I'm sitting in my living room, looking out these beautiful windows out to what just fields as far as you can see. It's out in the, the west part of Colorado Springs, the east part of Colorado Springs, going towards Kansas. And I'm sitting there for hours, just meditating, doing CE5, you know, meditation. I had two dogs. I had both parrots with me, right? We're all sitting there doing meditation. We're doing CE5. And after about four or five hours, it's like, I don't know, two o'clock in the morning. I'm like, okay, I'm done. I'm, that's it. I'm going in. And I stood up to go in and go to bed. And this voice comes in and says, Pat, we are here. I'm like, you're here? I've been here for like five hours. I got to go to bed. I'm really tired. <laughs> So, so you can make contact anywhere. Uh, so, so even if you have an, uh, like an obstructed view, whatever that obstructed view is, whether it's the roof on your house or trees or whatever, you can still make contact. Okay, that is, but it's better, obviously, with an unobstructed view of the sky. Uh, possible remote area, natural area. Do we talk about that? Well, I could just share that. You know, we see people coming out from the city, like I said, that have only seen the moon. And if you've never been out in a remote area where you can actually see the Milky Way, I mean, it's absolutely, that, that experience is quickly going away on this planet because of the light pollution. And uh, there's some organizations out there, Dark Sky, and, and uh, I forget the exact names, but you can look them up online and, and they have maps of light pollution maps. You can see where the light pollution is, is better or worse, you know. Uh, but it's truly an amazing experience to be out, if you are able to go out in nature, um, and, you know, one of the things about being in nature, you see the Milky Way, you see that tree that I talked about. And if you look past the concept of that tree and you see what's there, there's a stillness in that tree. And just the fact that you observe that helps that stillness to arise in your own consciousness. And it's very helpful. And you can do that in your home, too, with a plant or anything. But if you can go out in nature and do this, see the Milky Way. And I just love sitting up against a big old oak tree or an old tree that's been there and, and meditating. It, there's such a stillness, uh, such a beauty to that. So it's wonderful if you're able to go out and do that. Let me add really quickly one thing I forgot to mention. When we were talking about the Travis Walton story and how it created that fear in me, um, it was Dr. Greer's work that 
unlocked that for me and showed me, first of all, that that's not what happened at all in that story. That movie, you know, it says based on a true story. I've learned since then. Back then, I didn't have the discernment as a college student, but I've learned since that based on a true story means nothing to Hollywood, right? You actually find the story of Travis Walton to be a very beautiful and uplifting story. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, can I just share that really quickly, what happened there? Um, you know, Travis Walton was a, a logger on a logging crew in uh, near Snowflake, Arizona, uh, not too far from where we are here in Phoenix. And uh, it was they were running late on a contract, running behind, and so they were working late, cutting trees uh, for the Forest Service, I believe. And uh, as they were leaving the mountain, it was dark, and it had been kind of rainy and, and damp. And they came around the corner, and there's this beautiful, gorgeous disc floating in the, in the field there. Well, without any warning, Travis Walton, they stopped the truck out of fear. And then Travis, having no fear, opened the door, ran out underneath this disc, right? And then when he got there, he started thinking, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. And he, he, <laughs> he crouched down like this, you know. <laughs> and then he thought, I'm going to go back to my truck. Well, at that point, this disc was powering up to move away, right? And Dr. Greer has had witnesses have told him that these discs operate on an amazing amount of electricity. They estimate something like the total output of a nuclear power plant is what is running these disks with the electrogravitic lift. So as it powered up to move away, uh, Travis Walton decided this was a good time to leave. And he kind of stood up and closed the distance between him and this electrical source. And he thinks now that some static charge found its way to ground and electrocuted him. He fell down, his friend saw that and left, right? Now here's the thing. Yes, they left. They said, he's dead, we're gone. They drove away. Now the ETs have a choice here, right? Here's this guy that's just been electrocuted. He's gonna die within minutes. His heart was probably defibrillated. He's gonna be dead on this mountain in five minutes if we don't do something. Right, so they're put in this position. So they picked him up, took him on board. Five days he was missing. Toward the end, and, and Dr. Gruss says that it takes about five days to flush the kidneys after an electrocution because if they block up, the person will still die. And he was missing exactly five days. He remembers the last 20 minutes. First thing he did was woke up and saw something that was not human and grabbed a sharp object and tried to attack them. They restrained him against some kind of like a gravity wall. Another ET came in that looked so much like humans, he, he started talking to him, thinking he was human, telling him all about these other ETs that were there. <laughs> I'm sure with some excitement. <laughs> They gave him a short tour of the ship. Now, here's a beautiful thing of that story. They took him to a room that was like this, opaque on all sides, walls, right? But there was one chair in the middle. Except for that chair, there was nothing else in the room, just a chair. As he walked towards the chair, the walls became translucent more and more. And as he got to the chair and sat down, he could completely see through the ship. He was looking at stars. They let him fly it for a bit. And then he got up, they finished the tour of the ship, they transferred him to another ship where they uh, put some kind of a mask on him and he went to sleep right away. Then he woke up on the side of the road near the town where he lived, fully clothed, not naked in the phone booth like the movie predicted, you know, showed. <laughs> with slime hanging off of him, you know, none, none of that. He was fully clothed, conscious, and healthy for the rest of his life after that, right? So they fixed the medical issue that was there returned him mercifully to the planet. Now, what did we do? We, of course, had a xenophobic reaction to this and created a movie accusing them of all this hate. And when I realized that I had spent 10 years of my life in hate and anger for something they didn't even do, right? It really affected me, and I'm emotional about it to this day. And my story is not important. What's important is that this is a common experience that people have. And if you get into this evil, scary ET stuff, it affects your life in many, many ways. Even having that low level of fear, there have been studies that say it affects your health, right? Because your body can either produce uh, chemicals to regenerate or for a flight or fight, fight or flight, but only one of the two. So if you're always in a low level of fight or flight fear, you're not regenerating like you could be. So it affects your very health. So for that reason alone, get out of that, out of that stuff, right? Right. 
Um, that part that he talked about where the craft became completely transparent, should I share that, do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, okay, so, so this thing about the crafts becoming completely transparent is real. It, it's a real thing. Um, they have the technology to do this. Uh, and for them, I think it's probably fairly, fairly simple. Um, on one of the events that I went to, I remember if it was Joshua Tree or Oracle. I think it was Oracle. Um, I am sitting in a chair in a circle. We're all meditating, right? It's one of the meditations that we're doing with Dr. Greer. And uh, people were sharing about their experiences with craft. And, and I remember sitting there just thinking to myself, wow, I wish that I could go on a craft. I wish I could go on a craft. Let me tell you that that is all it takes because within seconds, I was on a craft in consciousness completely. I mean, I was so in shock at first. I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> what's happening? I'm literally standing on, on a little rise, like a little platform inside this craft that is all dark gray. Everything is dark gray. There is very diffuse light in there. There are windows along one area. I look over to the right. I can see through the window. I can see earth. And I'm like, oh my God, this is, for me, this is a dream come true. I, this is like a dream come true. Obviously, I am never going to be an astronaut, right? So um, I think to myself, oh my God, I am going to be able to see the earth. I'm going to go over there and look out that window. The minute that I had that thought, the entire craft became transparent. I am literally standing in it, what, what felt like I'm in the middle of space. There's nothing underneath me, around me. I'm like, oh my God. And of course, you know, I, I, have, I have fear of heights. <laughs> okay. And I will tell you that that was all it took was that second of fear of looking like this. Oh, and I was back in my chair. That's all it took. I have asked numerous times. I've said, look, I've solved this. I'm, I'm okay. I can do this again. I can just come back. So this is true. And I, and I shared this with uh, another good friend, Lori Williams, who runs Intuitive Specialist. I'm sure some of you have probably taken her classes. She does remote viewing. Um, she and I were talking on the phone one day, and I, I told her this story. I said, most amazing thing ever, man. And she, I start to tell a story, and she's like, oh, my God, the same thing happened to me. She ended up on a craft. She looks at the window. She's going to go over. The entire craft becomes transparent. So this is a real thing. This really happens. They really have that capability. It's real. So uh, mind-blowing stuff, truly. Um, there are moments I have to think, God, did I dream that? What? Is that real? God. But, you know, if you get into CE5, you're going to spend a lot of time saying stuff like that. Just FYI. <laughs> okay. So... I think we've kind of come to the end of this possible remote area, natural area. Did you want to put up any slides, like a slide of Joshua Tree? or? I've got some site? here. We'll come to them. Okay. Because I had a couple in here, too. Okay. Let's see. CE5 app messaging. I am actually on that support thing, so if you have problems with your CE5 app, just send a little email in there, and we'll get you fixed up. On the CE5 app, so, so this is ideas for assembling teams. These two first things that we're going over here, finding a site and assembling your team, I personally think are the two most difficult things of setting up. Would you say? Absolutely. Setting up a group. Mm -hmm. If you can solve these two things and get these two things done, you're, the rest is a little bit easier. You're on your way. Uh, so we've gone over finding a site. Now we're talking about assembling your team members. And, and this is really a, an important subject here. You can go into the CE5 app message. The CE5 app has a messaging feature. It has a network feature, right? And you can go in there. You can see the people who are around you, that have, live around you, who have this app. And you can message them. Does that messaging work pr properly and perfectly? Not always. Do people respond? Not always. I mean, you can send out messages to people. They may or may not respond. I mean, people can get a little fearful about that. They're, they're responding. They don't know the person. But that is one option for you. Uh, you did something amazing. Didn't you do something with emails or something? And you found a lot of people that way? Yes. We, we, we 
took the emails through the different methods like the contact app and and uh, back then when I was doing this they had a C5 VT contact website I think that many of you might remember but but you could it was the same thing as the app you could c contact people and get their emails so I just got emails and started sending emails group emails out saying hey if you're interested we're having a meeting here for startup group blah 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 and you can do that I just get the emails and uh, and send that out and you'll be surprised you'll get people that will respond to that they may not always respond immediately to the app, the text message, and say yes, but if you can get an email address or contact and send an email to do that. Now, one of the things that I do recommend as you're setting up Teams uh, is to really protect people's privacy, and that can be an issue sometimes. Don't send an email with a huge list of email addresses to everybody saying, can you come do CE5? Because uh, I won't lie to you, there are certain people out there that are not interested in CE5 that will pretend that they are just to get in, in into the group, right? So don't, and we've had teams set up and had issues with that. So it's not a thing to worry about, but just uh, common sense, protect people's identity, their email addresses. One of the things we used early on was, I got tired of doing the, you know, you can send an email to yourself and BCC everybody as a big group, and it gets complex. I found it. I'm, I'm, I'm a country boy, it's got to be simple. And there's a bunch of uh, services like uh, Constant Contact, MailChimp is one we use, and where you can, it's so easy, you just put in their email address and you can send out a group email to everybody uh, without disclosing their email address. So that's an option too. Okay. Um, okay, and also, let's talk about the size of your group. Uh, it can be one person, it can be five, it can be 15. You get much more over eight or 10. I mean, it's it's a big group. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And it can be you. It can be you and a few friends. Look around through your friend group. See if there's anybody who you're friends with or anyone in your family who has an interest in this. And you can start your own group. It can just be a few people. It can just be a few people that you know well. It doesn't have to be, you know, pulling in people that you don't know if you're uncomfortable with that. Um, social media. This is an option, but this you need to be a little bit more careful with. Obviously, we all are aware of the Facebook groups that are out there that are CE5 groups, right? Uh, and they're, they at don't... They, at least they claim to be. Pardon me? At least they claim to be CE5. Yes, they claim to be CE5. <laughs> yes. Um, it's not always the best energy, and you have people in there who, who uh, they use the word trolls, and so when I say the word trolls, I imagine one of those things from back in the movies, but, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so on social, but you can go on a social media site, and you can say, hey, I'm in this area. Is there a group already? You might be able to find a CE5 group that's already established, um, and you can give that group a try. Give it a try. If it's not the right fit for you, don't hesitate to make your own. Um, you know, there are some cities, there may be five or 10 different groups. Just because uh, there's one group in one area doesn't mean that you have to either be in that group or no group. Start your own if you want to. Um, like I said, you know, there can be five, 10 groups, uh, like in different major cities, you'll find that. So that's... Yeah. Exactly. And, and, you know, we're going to kind of show you a way to do this because this is the way we've done it, just to give you something to start with. But Dr. Greer has always said he's not, you know, there's no set way to do this. Um, if, if there are a million people doing this, there are a million different ways to do it properly. So different groups are going to operate differently. And if, like Pat said, if, if it doesn't fit your energy, then just start your own or find another one. There are going to be more and more and more teams starting. And this is going to be a, a very important thing going on on the planet. And you can just start with yourself. I started with myself. Pat started with herself. Everybody I know started with themselves, getting the basics right first, spend some time doing that, then start slowly adding to your team. And it's better to add, you'd be better off to add one person that has the basics right than 50 that are kind of so-so, right? Because the energy gets mixed. So start out, it can be a very small team, uh, three to five people maybe, and that's fine. Um, and uh, you're much better off to have a small team that's coherent and has the basics right than a bigger team that has a mixture of energy. Because I can tell you, we've seen it many, many times at different events in Texas. Um, a group will be there, contact will be happening, and then obviously there's some energy that is negative that somebody in the group has not disclosed, either fear or even something simple like they're angry at somebody else in the group because they talked about something they don't believe in. There's a little argument there. That energy 
to an extraterrestrial being that has technology that expands into the astral intent and consciousness is a huge red flag. There's this conflict, right? So even the smallest little thing, they're upset because somebody said something um, that can stop contact. And I've seen that happen. That is an actual experience, not an academic posing that I'm making to you here. So it's very important to get the basics right, and on your team, you know, we talk, I think we have a slide to talk about this later, but I'll just talk about it now, too. It's very important um, um, that you not have divisive conversations during the CE5. Now, this is an interesting thing because you're going to have to help people get over fear. So you don't want to just say, oh, no talking about any of that. Um, you want to have a time where they can talk about it and ask honest questions because people coming in from the public are going to want to know what about all these scary things i see online you know and you want a time that you can talk about it but that should not be during your ce5 that should be at some kind of a teaching event or a get together or something where you can discuss those things but when you meet to do ce5 i always tell people you know i'm i'm i I've got a very busy job i'm away from home a lot when i'm home i want to spend time with family and I do very other little extracurricular stuff, but one of the things I love to do is CE5. So when I do CE5, I want to do CE5. I don't want to be sitting in a, this milieu of energy, of negativity. Uh, that's a waste of my time. It's a waste of your time. So when you do CE5, don't allow people to talk about politics, for goodness sakes. Don't allow them to talk about the vaccine or the, do you wear a mask? All these things separate people, right? You don't want that conversation going on during your CE5. It will not work, period. And that's an actual observation, not just me saying academically, okay? Yeah, we have had that where someone, we will be on a break, even on your breaks. I'm telling you, this is really important. Even on your breaks, Keep the conversation of a high energy level. That means you're talking about positive things. We've had breaks where somebody say, wow, did you see I saw this thing online about these really, they eating people. And I'm like, okay, the minute that that happens, you have already interjected something extremely negative and very, very low energy into your group. So my feeling is, you know, really, honestly, the whole thing with the movies and the online sites, the, you know, the Reddits, the Facebooks, even, you know, we have a Discord for Dr. Greer that we keep very clean. I mean, we don't allow any of that. But there are plenty of Discord servers for CE5 where they have all of that, right? There's video games, all of that. I always tell people, look, you are what you eat. You are what you ingest. If you ingest that kind of stuff, you are literally building that reality for yourself. So don't do that. It would be, your time would be better spent in meditation than to go to those places. Really, I would say avoid them. I know that people get very into, it's a lot of fun, it's exciting, reading all these weird things, but I am telling you that gets into your consciousness. It's not a good idea. And it definitely doesn't belong in a CE5, even on a break or before or even after. It can truly add negative energy.